Hey, are we ready there for some uh, some intros here? Right? Welcome in all of our panelists. We still have uh, Joe Freddy by phone, correct? Yeah, Rob. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'm not sure if Joe's recovered from that last segment <laughs> or not. Here, so. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's introduce the crew today. We start with Alonzo Perry first. It was William Congreve who wrote, Heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. And I believe that to be true, that fury so charming, until I learned otherwise while interviewing Sheriff Nate Harmon. It was Monday this week, chock full with an audience full of contrarians. A nicer way of saying we were overwhelmed by a cult of angry libertarians. <laughs> And who stirred up this bunch that was so angry and not merry? It was none other than our next panelist, ladies and gentlemen, Alonzo Perry. Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? How are you, Alonzo? Doing? Good to see you. How's your week been? My, you know, this week has just been outstanding. Well, I, I think you know, I've had a lot of fun. Well, here we are again, just one week hence, from a day with no knowledge of classified documents with Pence. Larry Schultz couldn't be happier that Pence stole Biden's bad press. But the timing is interesting, and it makes me hazard a guess. I won't go too long, and I won't do a rant. But come on, man, doesn't this reek of a plant? With the heat on Biden, isn't it convenient that Pence joined this mania? Was the box Pence found marked with the return stamp, Joe Biden, 1600 Pennsylvania? <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be here. We're living an interesting time. While Big Jim tours the state and cuts a new path, Republicans are convinced that he's very good at math. They say his tax cuts don't add up right with that percent set at 50 when coupled with his spending plans, which aren't very thrifty. The governor, the House, and the Senate are in distress. Perhaps we need a negotiator to settle this mess. The people want tax cuts and not to be held over a barrel. Perhaps we need a new negotiator and a former tax commissioner, Mike Carroll. Thank you, but uh, I, I, I'm too biased against justice to play that role. <laughs> Fair enough. He was there with me Monday when the horde stormed the gate. Even the ones who showed up at 930 and totally missed Sheriff Nate. He stayed steady while the crowd metaphorically tried to grab us. When he asked what they wanted, they yelled, Fire Harmon! Release Barabbas! <laughs> there was nothing he could do to appease the wild throng, which is when Joe Ferretti exclaimed, People! Can't we all just get along? <laughs> Joe, good morning to you. I still haven't recovered. <laughs> <laughs> I bought myself a Mega Millions ticket some time ago for yucks and matched myself two numbers in the Mega Ball, which pays out a sweet ten bucks. Now, as it turns out, it was the same day someone claimed the billion-dollar jackpot. And as the Admiral learned of my good fortune, he said to me, Boy, let me tell you what. I've given you counseling through the years, indeed great advice. And for that wisdom, I have not charged you even a tiny bit of a price. But that's all changed once you hit some numbers and began to holler. Now I want my cut, and I believe that comes to one single dollar. Now pay my debts, I always do. And that's why, dear Admiral, I hand this dollar over to you. Oh, how nice, how nice. <laughs> Be sure to claim that on your test. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Rob will <laughs> for non-profit. <laughs> All right, Joseph, Joey, Torch, ready. We start with our leadoff hitter. Go. You know, Rob, Colin McLaughlin was correct. The way the camera was situated, you were literally a talking head. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, let's go right away to, uh, uh, since my discussion with Craig Blair elicited an appeal to Jesus, I, I'm going to avoid taxes. Fair and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a, a maybe obscure law, but something that could have wide impact given how popular our athletics are in Eastern Panhandle. Senator Ryan Weld, who's a serious senator, uh, has a bill proposed to liberate athletes in the state of West Virginia to transfer from one high school to another. Uh, it would allow one-time transfer, and the athlete would be able to keep their eligibility once they transfer. In fact, that eligibility would be such that an individual could play football for Martinsburg and transfer to Hedgesville and play high school for Hedgesville in the same year. Uh, now, this, the uh, Senate bill uh, has, was passed last year, so this is a serious proposal. Ryan Weld thinks it's going to pass the House this year, and we're going to have these transfer rules instituted in the state. So my question is, are we opening up West Virginia's own athlete portal? What problems can that 
cause? And is it the wrong message coming from our legislature when we're struggling so mightily with academic achievement that the, the legislature would see fit to focus on athletics to this extent? All right, let's start with the youngest person in the room who's probably the least removed from athletic uh, experiences than the rest of us. Alonzo Perry. So my first question, Joe, is uh, is this only for athletics or is this just that students will be able to transfer throughout the district um, that they live in? And um, what is kind of the parameters of this? That's, that's the first thing. Well, well the, the bill, Alonzo, is, uh, deals with uh, athletics uh, and, and the eligibility question that arises when they transfer. Because currently when you transfer, the SSAC requires you to sit out a year So in their words, you can settle into your school. But this bill would propose that you're eligible right away. You don't lose any eligibility. Hmm. I I don't think that this is a a positive thing for uh, athletics simply because, you know, I think that it just develops super teams. Um, But I I do think that, uh, you know, being able to transfer schools is a positive. Uh, you know, whether it's in regards to bullying, I think that it's sad that this is uh, focused on athletics. I'm not even a fan of the co- collegiate level uh, transfer portal, as I think that that's going to start having implications, uh, you know, kind of like what the NBA is facing right now, where, you know, talent is just pooling to certain sections of the league. And, you know, uh, we're developing these super teams. I, I don't think that this is a positive, a positive change and I think a lot of kids that are you know extremely athletic they're going to want to go to Martinsburg you know they're not going to want to stay at Musselman or stay at Hedgesville and uh, build those programs to the potential that they could possibly be so um, I guess I'm actually opposed to this measure. Well kids are transferring now already by the way and and doing those things so Mike Carl go. I I think I agree with Alonzo that that it's just a prioritizing something that is way below what really matters is the academics and that you can transfer i mean there was a reason why that rule was put in way back it's to prevent uh, you know recruiting and games playing among you know rival schools and and so i i agree that it's a bad idea this this was put in i think originally the case was a kid from a private school that was transferring to a public school and they were going to make the kids sit out a year before that kid could play sports, and, and I, I think uh, that's what kind of got all this all started. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, I uh, I have a different view from what Mike and Alonzo have. Uh, we cannot compare this to college portals uh, because we very few families will be able to uproot from Martinsburg, for example, to move to Morgantown just so their kid can play one year in college. So it's going to be basically in in a uh, uh, a much smaller area. Uh, we like to think that the college that the athletes are uh, are 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 scholar athletes a lot of them going to be using this as the next stepping stone to get to college why not have a kid that sees a better opportunity with a better coach to move across town to go to another school? The individuals that are going to be most upset would be the fans of that end of that school that's losing the star player. Uh, I see no reason at all of giving these kids an opportunity to enhance themselves either on the scholastic front, academic front, or the athletic front. Larry. I foresee just a a host of problems with this, which are the kind of problems that arise when you have terrible problems in a school system and you elect to address only this sort of thing. (laughs) Um, And part of the problem is this. I can remember as a high school football player, um, teammates of mine getting in trouble in school and sometimes serious trouble that somewhat got overlooked because uh the you know he's a star player you can imagine how much less likely administrators would be to punish the star football player at just pick a high school name from this county if they thought he would say oh you're gonna you're gonna apply the rules to me well then i'll be at muscleman next year or i'll be at at hedgesville next year um i'm walking out of here And we're not talking about if the parents move to the district where the school is. We're talking about potentially, as Bill suggested, a kid from Martinsburg or who can't make the team going to Morgantown and living with his brother, uh, you know, who's a few years older and is living in an apartment there and going to school in Morgantown. But, But there's nothing stopping the kid from doing that now. You can do that now. 
probably if you, if true. You, if you have parents who are divorced and live in different school districts, the kids routinely pick the parent who lives at the better school district for the sport they excel at. I, I mean, I guess that's true, but now you would bring the coaches and the staffs into it. Now everybody has a stake, and now this has become a special player, a special person who can't be punished, who can't be treated, must be treated differently from the average kid. It's just the wrong message to send in a school, in a place where we have the 45th or 6th ranked schools in the nation. Can the coach coach wherever the coach wants to, regardless of where the coach lives? Can the, can the teacher teach wherever the teacher wants to, wherever, yes. regardless of where the teacher lives? Then why does the kid have to be the only one to follow zip code rules? Well, I guess the reason I would say that is for a whole bunch of reasons. When that kid's 15, the teacher can drive a car, and the principal can drive a car, but he can't drive a car. He's not old enough to <laughs> but drive the, a car. But the parent can. <laughs> <laughs> And so, I mean, there are different rules. There are different rules for kids than there are for professionals working. Now, if you live in Martinsburg and you want to teach at Morgantown High, that's going to be a long commute unless you move. I mean, it's going to be a long drive every morning. But the kid's not going to do that either. No one's going to live in Hedgesville and drive to Morgantown because their basketball team's better this year. Right. I I don't think it's the same thing. And, And I guess my biggest objection, though, is we have so many giant problems that this is you know nothing and if this legislature is not going to spend their time on the giant problems don't insult us by spending your time on this mickey mouse larry generally your arguments are very persuasive today you're not (laughs) i'm I'm, not doing well today i gave him a dollar he is not going against me today i'm fully persuaded and and that's pretty rare when larry's talking I, I rest. I rest my point, Larry. <laughs> what about what about for you know? I mean, to be able to have that buffer period though for you to play the next year, as opposed to you just being able to play that same year, uh, that incentivizes you to leave. You know, once your school doesn't make the playoffs, once you know, uh, maybe you know, you guys aren't going the direction that you thought that the team you know potentially was going to go in, and so you know. It just creates all types of pervasive incentives for you to switch in the middle of the year. Okay. I don't think that that's you know a, a, a net positive. I think that you know when you realize, oh, my team's not going to the playoffs, well, I'm going to go to Martinsburg gives you and get D. some extra times. And what if your teacher gives you a D and you, you you know you earned a D and so you got a D, but that D means you can't play football at the school you're at. Will you be able to transfer? Well, the and schools start over? the schools follow county rules. So you're, you're going to transfer to another school in the county. Your grades come with you, so that's a moot point. Okay, but if you transfer to one outside the county, it may not be. It well, may not apply. I mean, it depends on how far you're going to go. I'm surprised our Republican colleagues are arguing against freedom. individual freedoms. Individual freedoms. They are. We have them all on record here. No, no. Just like our, our so, Rhino Mike Carl over there. Just like our liberal lawyer colleague across the table from me is arguing for academic quality. <laughs> and, and and not the focus on this secondary issue. Joe, uh, back to you. Well, Rob, I have to admit to, to the listeners and, and to the crew here this morning, I, I'm torn on this because personally, I lived in the Martinsburg School District, and my daughter, as you know, played volleyball at Musselman. Uh, and, and her exposure through that program uh, allowed her to play Division One sports uh, at the college level. So uh, I can see where the athlete and the family would look at opportunities that exist for those athletes beyond high school and would think the transfer rules are necessary. But I also agree somewhat with what Larry is saying, that the, you know we are opening up Pandora's box here in terms of allowing these athletes to transfer, even in the middle of a school year, to play one sport and another. So uh, I, I see some real problems. I would hope that the legislature would anticipate what those problems are, and if they allow transfers, that they put parameters on the rules. J.R. House, who won the Kennedy Award while playing at Nitro and broke the state's passing records before throwing the ball every down was the thing to do, routinely played football at Nitro in the fall and then played baseball in Florida in the spring. His parents were able to do that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how the residency worked out and how they did it with him specifically. But because J.R. House was a baseball prodigy, he had stuck around the major leagues for a little bit, they were able to do that, and it paid off a bit in a major league career for him. So this has been done for 
at least 25 years. And if you check around the area, it's not uncommon for the best player on somebody else's team to wind up on the best team the next year. That's not their one from the previous year. That happens pretty commonly. And there, is no, there are no rules that, that are in place to actually prevent that. So I, I think this just kind of uh, stops the SSAC from making it get kids sit out a year for what's already going on right now with no repercussions. But it's the players that bring the scouts, not the you know the school programs that bring the scouts. And I think that that's something you know really important for us to drive home. I mean, you could take um, there was that tight end from uh, Musselman that's now in the NFL. Uh, I can't think of his name. Off Trayvon Wesco. Trayvon Wesco. I'm here yeah, to help. I mean, you know, he he played at Musselman, and Musselman's not a school that you would you know think that oh is going to. Pre- produce an NFL talent as opposed to, you know, uh, someone if he would have transferred to Martinsburg and probably got more looks because there's scouts that sit, you know, during their practices. So uh, it's really about the quality of the player and also their communication uh, as with parents with these schools, you know, to tell them, look at our highlight tapes, you know, filming the games. All of those things are what's important to getting someone to that next level. Uh, I don't believe that, you know, this bill, and I don't know what was the reasoning behind it, but I think it's fixing a problem that doesn't need to be addressed. And the problem, really, I'm telling you, it stemmed from a private school kid that tried to transfer back to a public right. school, and they wanted the kid to sit out the entire season before they could play. Mm-hmm. And I think that the SSAC already needs reined in. Uh, they don't answer to anybody but themselves. I'm not a big fan of the SSAC, and that's putting it nicely. I'm not a fan at all of the SSAC. So anything that they can do to curtail their unbridled power to me is a good thing. Joe, hang on. Uh, Bill, you're on the clock. You're next. Okay. Now we go to issue number two with our Friday Five panel and the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Sir William. Rob, I'd intended to uh, have an issue that addressed national issue, uh, and that was, uh, will the third rail of politics, i.e. Medicare and Social Security, be invoked as, as the debt ceiling arguments being used? Uh, but I think I'm going to leave that for another day. After listening to President, uh, Senate President Craig Blair a few minutes ago, I think I want to discuss West Virginia tax reform. What will it look like? Uh, the uh, going into the session, I thought it was a slam dunk. I thought they were going to uh, the. Uh, it would be very quickly approved. What the governor proposed, the House endorsed, uh, and then sent to the Senate. Uh, but recently, this past week, for example, uh, Eric Householder has, uh, as much as he will ever do, Eric's a gentleman in the true sense of the word. He's not about to throw stones at his colleagues, either in the House side or on the fence side or the Senate side. But as cl- close as uh, Senate uh, as Eric would do or could do, he said, "What in the heck is going on in the Senate?" Uh, John Hardy uh, said this week that he was less and less optimistic there was going to be a tax reform to come out uh, this uh, uh, this year this session. This morning with Craig Blair, I got the impression, and Craig was I thought Craig was making some good points. Some I understood, others I had more trouble understanding. Uh, But the point I thought Craig was saying is that to solve this problem is going to be fairly simple. We take the three-year program the House and the governor proposed of a 50% tax cut spread over three years. This is personal income tax and reduce it down to just one year, make it all at once. But at the same time, uh, Craig was saying we have to study all the issues uh, and to be sure that we're not taking too radical a step. Well, in my view, going from three years down to one year is a more radical step. So I want to come back to what John Hardy said. Will we actually have a tax reform coming out of this year's session? All right, Joe Ferretti, let's go to you first. Well, I hope so, <laughs> for the Republicans' sake. Uh, but I, I can't help but think that the Senate proposal that's being rumored at this point, which is 50% all at once, but we need revenue enhancement through a 2% sales tax increase from 6 to 8%. I can't imagine that that's a serious proposal. I have to think that is just negotiating because the Senate and Craig Blair – fully are aware that so many of them have signed these pledges to never raise taxes, the Grover Norquist pledge, that there's no way they're going to go on record 
of voting for a tax increase, they'll be primaried in this state, which is the biggest threat to the Republicans who hold office today. So I, I have to think that's just a negotiating ploy, and I am hoping that the Senate will agree that a graduated approach to tax cutting is the way to go. What Eric Householder and John Hardy have proposed, 30 percent, and then some kickers in place to go an additional 10 percent in later years if the state meets revenue projections. That would be the safest route, and I have to believe that's got to be the proposal that has the most support. Former Tax Commissioner Michael Carl. I largely agree with Joe's uh, discussion and comments, Uh, but this business about a 2% sales tax increase, did Craig Blair say that? (laughs) He said that? Well, then then it clearly is is, Joe is even more right, because there's no way he's going to support that. I mean, Blair is not going to be part of that. That is just throwing something out to make a point about about the – uh, effect of tax changes and the you know stimulating the economy or or, or not so so I I completely agree that that that's just a discussion point I'm stunned that, it, that he would even go that you know he would say it let alone me it certainly doesn't mean it so uh, that that's uh, there, but I am encouraged that uh, I think I think I think the the answer is th- that there will be a significant uh, tax relief. Uh, b- bill passed uh, that will involve multiple years of relief and phase in. Mr. Schultz. Um, I can't wait to see how the revenue projections match up to the revenue um, results. In other words, I presume that anybody who's talking about these kind of level of tax cuts has got to be responsible enough to project the revenues, the revenue losses uh, that will at least attend the first year. And how are they going to back that up? Are they then going to simply say, we don't have the revenues, so we're cutting this, we're cutting this, we're cutting this, this, and this. No more highway program, no more, um, no more, um, no chance of a school uh, uh, salary increase for teachers. Um, we're not going to bother hiring that last one third of the child protective services workers who still don't have a job, you know, who they still don't have the things. We're just going to blow that off. There's got, they've got to, at the very least, have responsible projections. And what we need to do as citizens, I think, is watch what those projections are and then come back in a year and let's see whether they were just guessing. Or, you know, and so, yeah, you do this all at once, you're really courting disaster. If you do it a little bit at a time, not 30%, but maybe 10 or 15 then you get a chance to look at the effects before you've bankrupted the state. What scares me is they'll, they'll reduce it by 50%, suddenly realize they can't possibly pay the budget out of that money, and then say, boom, sales tax increase, boom, sales tax increase, because there will be no other way to stopgap it. Um, that's really scary. The, the, the House is already to the governor's tax cut bill added immediately a committee substitute and then passed it 90 something you know to uh to to use a fund that had already been set up due to uh, householders leadership uh to accumulate surplus revenues to cover issues like that or to fund the next year's relief 700 million dollars yes alonzo i just you know i'm shocked as uh, Mike Carl says you know it's 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 like they want to drop the floor you know they're they're the whole concern that uh, West Virginians have is that we're being led to a fiscal cliff you know for uh, Governor Justice's campaign that you know um, it, it's predicated on him having this big win here but you know to just say we're gonna you know uh, immediately add the 50 percent and then add a, a sales tax while well, families are already struggling with you know uh, rising costs uh, inflation and so forth, you know, it's just, I think that that's ill-advised. You know, it's already hard enough to go into the grocery store and be able to provide for your family. Now, uh, 
I think that this is really just an issue of priorities, though. You know, we want to bail out PEIA. We want to, you know, have uh, teachers' aides in classrooms. Uh, we haven't even factored in costs associated with breaking DHHR um, and some of the modifications that they w want to make. You know, it's time that we cut some of these wasteful departments. You know, we have a, a department that's just allocated for hiring. We have a, a department allocated just for uh, buying, purchasing equipment for different bureaucracies. We really need to deconstruct the administrative structure of the government that's leading to a lot of wasteful spending to uh, worry about, you know, um, some of these things that we want to pay for. But uh, I just think that, you know, uh, I actually agree with the House, and I think that the Senate is stalling based off personalities. And I think that that was an accusation that was made last week, and I, I think we're finally seeing the full effects of that. Billy? Yeah, I, I agree with what Alonzo, the last thing you said. I believe the uh, Senate is trying to find a way to push back and not give the governor full credit. I think, as Mike Carl said, I think it will pass. I think it's going to pass for two simple reasons. One, we have a budget surplus that's been advertised and been promoted uh, for the last several, several months, and there is a supermajority in the in the legislators. Uh, and if the, if the supermajority Republicans do not pass this this time, they'll never be able to live it down. So I think it will pass for those reasons. Joe, any final words? Well, I, I, and I would like my Carl's input on this. I, some states with, that rely heavily on severance taxes as a big part of their revenue, uh, Wyoming comes to mind, uh, they, they use like a rainy day fund and they bank the uh, severance tax money because it's so variable year to year. And in good years, when there's a lot of money coming in on severance taxes, then they state residents get a tax cut. In years where there's not so much money in the fund, they don't. It's almost like a floating tax rate. Is that even feasible in West Virginia, Mike? Uh, I, I, I would like to think so. I think, I think it's, a, it's a good idea because you're absolutely right. The, the, the uh, ebb and flow of, of, you know, of prices of, you know, severed you know uh, produced goods uh, is you know it's very far more radical than than just the general economic ebb and flow so i, I no, i think that would be a great idea i haven't i haven't heard it suggested but that doesn't mean <coughs> it hadn't been but, but it, it's a it's a good idea all right, that'll wrap it up. Unless you have a final word, Billy. No, I I, I had my, my, my I made my final statement a second ago. Okay. All right, we go to issue number three, and for that we go to Alonzo Perry. So the Jefferson County Commission uh, voted to change the Emergency Services Agency from uh, an independent agency to a civilian oversight to a county-run uh, department instead. Uh, restructuring ESA is directly responsible for the resignation of two of its top officials, uh, Captain Sarah uh, Considine and I butchered that. I'm sorry, uh, and Director Bob Burner. So Jefferson, Jefferson Jennifer Krause submitted an agenda request to the commission's next meeting to indefinitely suspend the ESA transition from an independent agency to a county department. And I wanted input it on um, whether we should revisit the independent agency with civilian oversight or continue with the plan to make it a county department and hire staff uh, for that new structure. I'm going to begin with uh, former county commission president in Berkeley County, Bill Stubblefield. The track record of Jefferson Commission uh, is not particularly impressive. They have a long history of fighting among themselves uh, on any issue. Uh, I think Berkeley County uh, has has been much more successful in get, uh, getting things done, but still, Berkeley County has not incorporated all of these under the county itself. Uh, so I I think that Jefferson County is looking for reasons just to uh, pick fights among themselves. Interesting take. Mike Carl. Uh, all I will say is I, I agree with Bill. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Quick. No, I, I, you know, say that again. Mike. Say, county, that, say that again. County government <laughs> mechanics is not the highest level of my focus. Also, no, you can't blame Joe Biden for any of this. No, no, no. Even even I wouldn't blame or, him for or, this. Or the vice president. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, if she were running, I'd be scared. <laughs> Joe Ferretti. Well, I, I'm I'm not well versed in this topic, but I, I do know that 
in addition to those resignations that Alonzo talked about, even the Jefferson County administrator now, I think his last name is Missile, mm-hmm. has resigned. So uh, there seems to be a lot going on over in Jefferson County government. Uh, but in terms of managing the emergency medical services, uh, I saw where <laughs> Rhineal, uh Fire Company uh, recently closed shop. Uh, and they, as I understand it, they were an independent uh, entity uh, operating over in Jefferson County for many, many years, and they've just quit providing services. So you have to wonder to what extent it's almost necessary for the county to step in to make sure that their constituents over there are getting the services that they need. It, it is a growing county, and to have uh, one of the mainstays in terms of providing emergency services shut their doors is a little bit of a concern. Yeah, actually, Ryan McMill is in Berkeley County. They service Jefferson County as well, but they're in Berkeley County. But there's also follow-up uh, support in this area as well, Joe. So it's not quite as dire as not having medical transport uh, when needed. Mr. Schultz. Right. I appreciate that clarification. It would be interesting, as Joe says, to hear the various sides in this argument say, we're doing this uh because of a failure in the system that exists now when we don't see any other way to fix it other than to put it directly in our own yard and manage it directly. Uh, are they saying that, or is there this just some big personality dispute on the, on the county commission um, among the members? Um, you know, um, we, we, there are five uh, commissioners in uh, Jefferson also, and we may someday decide that, that having a five people uh, a county commission instead of three wasn't the brightest idea anyone ever came up with. Um, that, that, you know, maybe we'd get more coexistence and, and sort of working together when it's a two-to-one thing. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's always the solution. Uh, it clearly has to be for a county the size of Berkeley. Not so sure it's all the altogether required in Jefferson. It makes for more fighting, uh, and there are more people trying to play the angle. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's a bunch of things that have nothing to do with the emergency services in Jefferson County that are a little fractured right now. Uh, in terms of the way their government works. And again, the point is the number of commissioners they have, a council member, is strictly up to the county itself. State statute says anywhere from three to, I think, nine or ten. So, Alonzo, oh back to you for the final word. Uh, I think my, my personal opinion on the matter is I support the uh, independent agency simply because it retains the uh, civil, civilian oversight, you know, component to it. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, uh, a discussion to be made uh, further about you know what are the pros and cons of the actual structure, but uh, I believe that the independent agency is probably the route to go. I think that the bureaucracy has absorbed more than what it's able to um, handle, and I think that you know by keeping it an independent agency, there's probably a uh, uh, most likely a better chance of survival and uh, providing you know I mean life saving care. That's what we're talking about here, you know. Um, All right. On that note, we wrap up halfway through the bottom of this hour here, and we come back with Larry Schultz. Now, issue number four on the clock for that is Larry Schultz. Yeah, uh, this is a national issue, I think. Uh, As we pass 37 mass shootings in the first 26 days of 2023, is there at any level of government any sort of answer that will work to reduce the numbers? All right. That's the question. We put it out to our audience, and I believe the most conservative member of this audience is sitting to my left, Alonzo Perry. Uh, so, I mean, what what level of government are you asking to intervene here? Anyone. I mean, uh, you know, Anybody who's got a solution. It's just, it's, it's a ridiculous notion, you know. Uh, we're, we're, first, we're misplacing the, the numbers. We're saying, you know, uh, there's 37 mass shootings and there's only been 26 days or however many days in the year and you know it's it's projecting this this sense of uh, uh, a, a misnomer in reality what is a mass shooting first of ah, all well there there are some variances and I think this is a somewhat conservative number in that way but generally I think this is something uh, where a shooter shoots uh, th- four or more people who are shot they don't all die four or more people, 
uh, not including the shooter himself. If he goes out in the parking lot and then kills himself and, and thereby saves the county a bunch of money, I guess they don't want to count that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's an incident in which that happened, and that sort of incident has happened 37 times in 26 days, including twice in three days in California. What government needs to do is to hold these progressive prosecuting attorneys accountable for uh, allowing criminals to go free. This is a, uh, an issue with criminals and not the issue of guns being in circulation in the country. When you compare uh, Switzerland and Germany, Switzerland you know, has very loose gun restrictions and allows for uh, uh, or doesn't have the same quality of mass shootings as compared to Germany, which has extreme amounts of gun control. And there's still a higher number of deaths in the country of Germany. So, you know, we're, when we sit here and cherry pick uh, data, it just allows for, you know, uh, these scare tactics to be presented. It, it, I don't believe that it's just a scare tactic. In, in almost every single one of these, people are dead. They have been shot for no reason whatsoever. It wasn't like they were involved in a robbery and the owner shot them. This is just a guy walking into a school or a department store or his workplace and killing everybody that he can kill before they kill that's him not or what he kills numbers, himself. That's not what your numbers accounted for. Your numbers accounted for a situation where four people were shot. This could be in four a gang. Or more. No, four no. Or they specifically exclude gang wars and drug, drug wars and that kind of stuff. They specifically exclude that. These are cases, like the two in California the other day, where some nut log has a gun who shouldn't have one for whatever reason, uh, but he does, and he shows up there and he kills everybody. States or he kills as many highest, as he can. The states with the highest rate of gun control in the entire country. And it shows that these type of laws don't work. These mass shootings aren't happening in the state of West Virginia. They're not happening in places with constitutional we, carry. And we don't so have forth. masses. You know? yeah. <laughs> we don't have masses. I mean, they've been killing people in big bunches down in Texas for as long as I've been alive. You might uh, remember the guy in the tower at the University of Texas shooting everybody. Um, Texas is a, always pretty liberal with regard to their gun laws. Everybody's allowed to have a gun, but they still have this problem. And, and Germany and Switzerland, they could only dream of having the level of problem that we have. Ours is much, much, much worse than either Germany or Switzerland or both of them combined. You Way asked, worse. You asked for a government solution, and my government solution is to hold progressive prosecuting attorneys who are allowing violent criminals back on the street to uh, basically stop that practice. Well, what That's about what's important. Larry, let me, let me get some other folks okay. in. Or you, at the end, we'll sure. come back to you. Joe Ferretti. Uh, uh, to Alonzo's point about liberal prosecutors, I, I'm not aware of any studies that are showing that the people committing these mass shootings are, by and large, people on parole or work release. Uh, I, I think it's often the narrative that we don't know where these people are coming from. They're loners. We don't know much about them. They're sitting at home in, in their mom's basement on the computer, uh, you know, doing God knows what. And, and, and those are the folks that I think fit the profile of these mass shooters. So I don't think this is a liberal prosecutor problem. Uh, I, look, the horse is out of the barn. We have 400 million guns in this country. They're not about to be confiscated. They're, they're, nobody's turning them in, and no government is going to have the wherewithal to even accomplish that. So all you can do is hope to mitigate the harm caused by people who are irresponsible gun owners or who are bent on destruction. And the only way to do that, I think, is to have a sensible law or two in place that limits the capacity of magazines and the repeatability of the gun that's being fired uh, so that, you know, the individual who's bent on destruction can only kill a few people as opposed to 50, like the guy in Las Vegas did out of a hotel window. I think that's all that can be done at this point uh, is to try to lim mitigate the harm that's caused. We, we, this is the society we've uh, you know, basically developed for ourselves, and we're going to have to deal with it. And Joe, before you get called a liberal hater of the Second Amendment, are you a gun owner, sir? <laughs> I am a gun owner, right. and, and I like to think myself as a responsible gun owner. Uh, and, and and so, I, I you know, it's not a case of the laws for thee, but not for me. Uh, I, I just think that, uh, you know, I don't have guns that fire with bump stocks, or I don't have 
a gun with a 30 clip magazine. So I, I, cause I don't use my guns for that purpose. And I, you know, I know the joys of shooting and target uh, and sport shooting and all that. Uh, but unfortunately as a society, there's some of us who, who are bent on, on, uh, causing mayhem and we're going to have to deal with that somehow just to mitigate the harm, but, not confiscate guns or say you can't buy certain weapons. And this is getting to the crux of the matter, which is how do you weed out from the responsible gun owners, of which Larry Schultz is also one, uh, from the people who should never be near a gun and are the ones who are creating many of these problems? We go next to Mike Carl. Well, that, that, that's a great question to set up what I was going to say anyway. I can read your mind, baby. <laughs> that's impressive. Uh, I, I, I think there ought to be super strong gun licensing rules that require all kinds of, of personality testing, study of your social media you know, exchanges and, and all that, and, and pretty frequent renewal requirements and mandatory prison for illegal possession, uh, unlicensed gun. And, and I think that... I mean, I'm, I'm not that uh, you want to you know, take the guns away. Then the Second Amendment is, it has to be respected. But I think that that all because of the and I agree with Larry. The, the, this the, you know these developments are evidence of, of it's getting worse and worse. And and it isn't, it isn't just uh, uh, you know all automatic weapons that you know like Joe was talking about. But but I think there ought to be really s- serious. Uh, licensing and renewal short term you know renewal periods and absolute mandatory felony sentences for illegal possession that that isn't consistent with the licensing uh, or violation of the licensing mr stubblefield yeah uh since the first of the year we've had more mass shootings than any time since the records have been kept uh the and I think today's discussion reflects some of our difficulty in getting to the kernels of it. Our first line of defense is to ask for definition. And if the definition doesn't suit you perfectly, we don't have a problem. The second line of defense is to invoke partisan politics. It's, it's with this group. It does not affect this group. Well, on the contrary, it affects all of us. Florida, North Carolina, Indiana, Nevada, Tennessee, you can name all of them, have had mass shooting to some degree. So how do we, we, we use partisan politics, I think, to our disadvantage as an excuse not to do something. I think this is a perfect example of doing it. But what can you do? That's a question. This past year, Congress passed some of the sweeping laws uh, that they've ever passed, including background checks and encouraging various states to adapt red flag logs. logs. Yet we still continue to have a, um, uh, an increase in violence. I am not prideful enough to think I have the solution, but I do think we have to have an honest debate in our legislators, our elected bodies, without invoking politics, invoking the idea, well, it happened more on your watch than my watch. This is all BS. We've got to come and have a meaningful discussion. It's just... It's, Good lunch. It's such a... a, a this is a hard topic, and this is you know, and, you're, and, uh, you, and you made it, and you tried to simplify it by making partisan politics. But that it's, was it's not about making partisan politics. But it's you, about did. Facing you did, you did. You used the term well, two or three times. About, you know, those liberal the prosecuting attorneys, those the, liberal progressive the, prosecuting attorneys. The actual solutions that are being presented to us right now is more gun licensing, felony sentences for illegal possession. Uh, you know, limiting the capacity of magazines. Uh, how far are we going to limit the, ca- the capacity of the magazines? Are we going to limit it to uh, three bullets to make sure that it doesn't qualify as a mass shooter? Are they not able to reload? Are they not? A- I mean, you cannot physically get into the mind of a maniac that is going to commit a heinous act. It doesn't matter what you do with the actual restrictions. The only restrictions you can put on is not the criminal element. You're going to put the restrictions on law-abiding citizens that want to protect their families and want to protect themselves when they are out in the public space and a lot of these issues are happening in states that have the most restrictive gun control laws that is the that is the fact and that is it, it's politics is a part of life and we have a cultural issue and we can't address that cultural issue uh, through the mechanisms of government I'm sorry uh, I'm quite certain that California has lots of highway traffic deaths 
that's not because they don't have laws regarding highway traffic. I'm sure they have more than any. It's because there's a mass of people all jammed in together. And there's a lot of big cities. And so the traffic problems get to be a little more complicated. But no one, no one here, no one in the sound of my voice is going to say, well, let's just treat cars the same way we do guns. Once you turn 16, you can go to the car lot, buy a car, and you don't need this license thing. You don't need this training to learn how to use it. You don't need somebody to say to you, hey, clown boy, don't be driving 80 miles an hour past the grade school or you're going to hit a bunch of kids. Um, You know, we have problems with cars being used that way, too. But it seems like when somebody goes off the deep end, uh, or finally deals with these urges they've been holding back for years, like this 72-year-old man in California, he doesn't use his car. <laughs> he could go to a crowd and hit him with his car and kill the four people real easy. Instead, he goes to a place where people are gathered. Imagine the terror. And look what we're doing to our kids, by the way. Kids now. When I was a kid, you had a fire drill. That was great. It was like an extra recess, right? <laughs> you go outside, you're playing around with your buddies until the teacher yells at you, and then you go back in. They have more active shooter drills in our public schools now, in a lot of public schools, than fire drills. And that's just a terrible message, a, a sort of a quiet message to send to children about what they're growing up in and what the other people they meet in their life might do to them it's horrible it's like it's not civilized the a-bomb drills we did when we were kids in the classroom the duck and cover under your desk like that was going to help yeah (laughs) (laughs) you'd be melted in a in a turned up lump underneath it it'd be easier to move your body then yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) as a paid football coach at oakdale high school i'm required to take numerous courses during the beginning of any season for a variety of things and two years ago i think they added the active shooter requirement course Mm -hmm. to be taken uh for the first time in all the years i've been associated with uh coaching at the school where i coach and now in addition to that they actually have uh this physical seminars that you can go to where you are taught by a a police officer or a former police officer uh, over a course where you physically go and attend and and learn different tactics and whatever. Those were never a part before of any training to coach kids in a sport until recently. So that's the way the schools are adapting to it. The question, though, still remains. Larry asked, what are we going to do to fix the problem? And my response is we do not have a process in place to fix a problem. We've got to agree on how to start a nationwide discussion on it without coming to pre-existing assumptions. I think in the, in the environment that we have, Larry, what would be your solution? Um, I think we have to put background checks in place for the purchase of any weapon specifically we have to limit the use of semi-automatic um 30 clip um you know weapons of war uh to a very small number of people um i don't believe in in my friends who say that the real reason for the second amendment is so you can fight off the government when they come to get you that's a that if we've devolved to the point where that's the purpose um, we've already lost, I believe. Yeah, you know, there's a bill going through the West Virginia House right now to arm teachers, to arm to get concealed carry permits for teachers. So let's imagine that what happened in Virginia a few weeks ago happens in, 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 in Martinsburg. So is the only solution for a six-year-old with a gun, uh, a bad six-year-old with a gun, a good six-year-old with a gun? The kid brings a gun in his backpack and shoots his teacher. Is the teacher being armed? Is the teacher's job then to kill the kid on her way down as she falls down? We can't live in this madness. And no wonder people don't want to come to the public schools if it's going to be like that. Um, That's just, it's crazy. Uh, And every time I read about this, it's ignited all over again. This, you know, I grew up around guns all my life. Guns aren't a danger. 
uh, people are the danger, but the gun person connection is where you address that danger, and we're not addressing it at all. Issue number five, Mike Carl. I want to go back to the state tax reform deal, and it's, to me a happy development. Separate, There's a separate bill that will provide the tax relief to, for the people for, pay, for paying the personal property tax on vehicles. It's limited to vehicles. But it includes, and this is the good news, the corporate income tax. So all vehicles, corporate-owned vehicles, will be eligible for the same relief. And and that that was a, actually a bill that the uh, was initiated uh, by, you know, with requests of the executive. So the governor is finally acknowledging the need for, and that I actually suggested that informally to Senator Blair. I'm not taking credit for that being in a House bill <laughs> from the governor, but it, it does suggest to me there there is some constructive discussion about dealing with with the personal property tax. Now, you have to put that in the form of a question so people can respond. So what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> do you, or no, do you agree? <laughs> yeah, that's much more limiting. Do you agree? <laughs> uh, all right, uh, uh, Joe, I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'm glad that Mike brought this up because, you know, in the 35-minute discussion we had with Craig Blair, not once – did we really address anything having to do with property taxes, whether it's equipment, uh, inventory, machinery, or the car tax? So um, I'm heartened to hear that there's a plan afoot to have, I guess, Mike, some kind of rebate plan in place yeah, so, so it, that people it, can pay their car tax and get money back? Yeah, it'd be like a credit against your income tax, personal and yeah. corporate. Okay, and this came from the governor's office, so I would imagine – uh, it'll be received well at the House level. Uh, I, I wonder, given what we heard this morning and what we've seen developing, whether it's going to be uh, addressed by the Senate in any substantive way. Well, you, you heard my story. I, I think it may have, you know, I'm, if, if I'm going to, cl- I may claim credit for it that it came through the Senate to the House and the governor's office. So that tells me, you know, that's why I'm encouraged that there's discussion uh, about positive things that affect the personal property tax situation as well. Now, I, my other suggestion was is they put Amendment 2 back on the on the 2024 20, ballot with the requirement that, of reimbursement, but but that's uh, I, I, I hadn't materialized yet. They hadn't gone that far. Anything else, Joe? No, I, I've, I've Mike wanted to know what I thought, and I've exhausted <laughs> it. <laughs> Alonzo! <laughs> I, just to, to reinstate the question, it's, this is if we're supporting of uh, the corporate income tax relief and property tax. For, for vi- corporate-owned vehicles. Oh, yeah. I mean, I supported Amendment 2 wholeheartedly. Yeah. I think that, you know, um, the issues that were in it, what we never talked about was that this was, you know, uh, huge for small businesses. You know, this is something that uh, – Small businesses have been struggling to survive during the largest wealth transfer in human history, you know, it feels like uh, with uh, the COVID pandemic and everything. And, you know, small businesses were the ones that paid the brunt for this. So removing a lot of the um, uh, those inventory taxes and some of our machinery taxes and uh, those issues were, you know, something that was for them, but it was never uh, perpetrated in that type of language. So it really, you know, led to uh, quite a kerfuffle. And, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, when I talk to people about uh, personal property taxes over this income tax reduction, most people want to get rid of their car tax, you know, over the actual income tax. Is that better for the state? I'm not sure, but um, I think people are, you know, really in support of that. But that's not how this felt like it was advertised. But it's, it's a small step in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. But we need to go beyond that in terms of property tax relief as well. I agree. Billy. Bingo. Yeah, I'm confused now. Uh, I thought what Mike was saying was a, uh, a relief through a rebate of corporate, ve- uh, per, uh, corporate vehicles, also personal vehicles. and But it did not extend to inventory tax. 
Am I correct on that? So I said it's a small step I, in I the know, right direction. I, I was picking up what Alonzo had yeah. said. It was an inventory tax. I don't well, think that, that's included. No, no, it's not not, okay. not in this particular no, bill I was okay. talking about. That's why we yeah. need the, to go back to Amendment 2. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was just trying to get clarification on the point that you made. Uh, but yet the uh, uh, the personal income tax is going to increase, is going to cost about $1.4 million. Billion. I thought okay, it could be B, and I I thought it was yeah. That, 50, you talk about the fifty percent? Yeah, that'd be yeah, that, B. That, that, okay, a one one point four billion dollars, and and the Senate and others say we're looking hard to see if we can afford that with our current ex, uh, spending. Can we in fact add a rebate on top of that and afford it? That's a, I don't know the answer to that, Mike. That was a basic question. I'm yeah, yes, if, yes, if you do it right. If, <laughs> 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 Larry, um, the, the amount of property tax that you pay on your car, even if it's a pretty new car, unless your income is so low that you couldn't afford a new car, your income tax cut's going to get you a lot more money than than canceling that property tax. Um, I think one of the problems that we're not talking about here is there's a little sensitivity on the part of the Senate and the House that justice went out and beat him down on Amendment 2. And that was a response to his sensitivity of not being out front and no, no and, question. And they're, they're taking the leadership. The, the problem is they're, they're now, they're going to be really careful before they if you're in an pub, elected public office and you make a proposal and it gets beat down what, 54 counties to one county? or whatever, you take a real deep breath before you make a similar proposal again. And I think that's playing a part in all of this. 